are listening to Hooked on Startups, where every week you'll hear from some of the most talented, inspiring, and successful entrepreneurs who share their real life stories, how they overcame challenges and failures, and how they mastered success. Get ready for some of the best business tips, tricks and tactics, and some frank, unscripted discussions. Here's your host, Matthew Sullivan. Yeah. Business stuff can wait, but we probably should sort of get into the business. And you seem to be you seem to have a habit of buying businesses. Um, yes, is, is that a is that a fair assertion? Very fair. Yeah. So I do uh, full You actually called. So you've actually you've actually um, uh, recognised this illness, and you've actually called the company Acquirer um, just to acknowledge <laughs> the fact that this is something that you do appreciate that you do. And um, is is um, so is it. A, what, what's the strategy? So, is it, I can see from, um, you know, from from the website that there is clearly a plan, like a roll up strategy. But um, tell us a bit about that. Um, is that the most relevant thing to talk about? Do you think, in terms of you know the business side? Yeah, I'd, I'd probably say so. What Acquira does is we help people buy businesses, uh, and then we are buying businesses ourselves, obviously. And you know, I'm even building a personal portfolio. We so that, that's. That's it in a nutshell. The reason for starting the company and why there's opportunity out there is because I'm sure a lot of your listeners know, quick Google search will tell you, we have this massive wave of the baby boomer generation retiring. Yeah. And they own the majority of small businesses in America. They're the backbone of America. They employ millions of people. And it's trillions of dollars worth of small business assets that need to switch hands over the next decade as these folks retire. So yeah. there's a, a decent amount of, of kind of small business supply and people looking to, to get out. Uh, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs are starting to be turned on to this idea of acquisition entrepreneurship now. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's amazing, you know, a few years ago when we started doing this, very few people that had, had heard about acquisition entrepreneurship, but everybody's familiar with you know, startup entrepreneurship or, you know, buying and, and flipping a house or buying and fixing a house and holding it for, for future cash flow. This is the same idea, but for uh, existing businesses. Um, but it is a, a long and a complex process. And also anybody can buy a business, even though that's, you know, you've got your hurdles to get through. But once you have the business, you know, how do you optimize and grow it? So uh, Acquira kind of helps people A to Z through that whole process over a multi-year relationship, basically. And so the challenge for you, I guess, is you've got two sides of the equation. You've got the buyer and the seller. Your role changes because, first of all, to find the, the correct acquisition target, you put your investor hat on, presumably, and you say, is this something that I would invest in? And then from yep. the entrepreneur's perspective, you have to put on your um, company hat and say, is this someone that I think is going to fit with this business? And in yep. other words, if you if you mismatch, if you don't have that that right correlation of skills and desire and uh, knowledge, I suppose, um, then you know the the transaction doesn't matter how successful the business is. It's it's very easy to become unsuccessful very quickly. So, oh, dude, yeah. And, 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 so how did, how did this start? In other words, what was the the, the genesis of this concept? Because clearly, you start with one idea, I would imagine. Um, and then you sort of build a business out of that. Is that, is that how it started for you? Uh, Acquira specifically? Yeah, I think, or just this concept of matching, of, of, of looking at entrepreneurship through a different lens. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it, it really just started out of that, that, that need, right? Like th these businesses are, are coming online and they, they need to sell re regardless. Uh, and, and what we saw was a pretty severe, you know, first of all, just lack of general knowledge on, you know, that, that business acquisition was even a thing for uh, you know, the, the average person yes. that has some business experience and some capital and wants to own their own business. Everybody's thinking of starting a business, but yep. then, uh, the, the, so there's the lack of knowledge there. And then also like lack of capital and, and just uh, you know, specific know-how. So yes. acquire a sort of a rose from that, that gap in the market we saw and, you know, in the last year, we've helped around, it's probably close to 400 uh, folks now yep. on their, on their business buying journey. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. And do you find that rather than, it's a bit like when you're trying to buy off market properties, you know, in real estate, mm -hmm. um, do you find that you're looking now to target specific businesses, almost as if you're a, a, a VC or a, 
uh, an investor where you're saying you know we like your business do you want to do you want partners do you want uh, you know new blood is that um are you expanding that way yeah so you know if, if you want to break deal flow down into a couple of buckets uh, really the only two it, there's there's on market and off market deal flow i'd say the majority of businesses that we're uh, at least the folks we work with uh, look at and buy they come through business brokers yeah um you know they're, they're, they're brokered but that in itself is a very fragmented industry not all brokers are created equal um there's a lot of consolidation to be done there honestly uh, and then the other bucket is is off market deals, as you mentioned. Uh, yes. You know, there's pros and cons to both, right? Obviously, uh, major pro to off market is you can be the only buyer at the table. You don't have that that buyer competition, and you can you know not have a middleman and connect directly with the seller. Uh, cons are it can be really difficult to find off market deals. You're calling yes. up businesses, kind of high EQ, yes. you know, emotional intelligence. You've got to like cold calling, um, and then once you get a hold of somebody who's interested in selling. You know these these folks have never been through this process. Well, their finances are messy. Yeah. Um, there's even a whole education process around what what their business is actually worth. You know that, that it's not worth uh, you know twenty times revenue. Yeah. Um, that it's worth more like three four times EBITDA. Right. So there's pros and cons to both. We do a lot of off market deal flow and can help folks with that. But- exactly. And is there um have you found as you've developed the business that there's a I wouldn't say spin-off, but there's these sort of additional um, possibilities for you to to not do a complete sale, but do a partnership where you're bringing in new capital, new partners, where the existing owner takes a step back. Um, and yeah, you know, you you may have a, a you just bring in a new, you know a, a new lease of life, as it were. Yeah, there's like a growth for equity model. There's 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 a few different ways to think about that that we've done. Um, in fact, you know, I mentioned I, I just moved here to Missoula, Montana. It's because I did exactly that. I, I personally bought a plumbing company. Well, I bought 80% of a plumbing company and the previous owners still, they're still on the org chart. They still work in the business and they've retained 20%. Yes. And so I'm, I've been working in tandem with them for about f- four or five months now. And that, again, there, there's pros and cons to that. Fortunately, in this case, there's been a lot more pros and we have a great working relationship and together we're, we're building this business, but that that's not a super typical situation. I'd say simply because most owners are looking to, they're they're either burnt out or they're just, they're looking to retire. Um, so they, they typically just want out, right. In in this case, these owners were, they've still got, you know, a couple decades left where they want to be entrepreneurial and build something that frankly, they were, they were just a bit, a a bit burnt out. Um, they'd started this thing 15 years ago, got it to a certain point, and they just simply don't know how to grow it. They've just created a full-time job for them. And yes. so me coming on board, we are scaling this thing now. And actually, I was just telling my wife yesterday, I, I'm so stoked because this, this just this last couple of weeks, I've been able to get them out of a bunch of tasks and things that were just eating up all their time that they hated doing. And now they're actually, they're having fun again in the, in the business. So that's super fun for me to experience and that's great so it's almost like a business recovery process mm-hmm. as well so are you looking for yeah. businesses where it's just a straightforward handover so you're looking at cash flow and or are you looking for undervalued businesses where the owners have become um, too embroiled in the business where they, you know they run the business rather than um, manage so you know what I mean where they they end up um, spending all their time as effectively a, an owner manager rather than working on the business yeah I mean to be quite honest that describes like 98 percent of, of these small businesses right and small businesses meaning uh, we're talking revenues between one and ten million and EBIT, EBITDA between you know a quarter of a million to to a million Yes. basically, uh, and, and employs anywhere from, you know, four to 50 employees, those types of businesses, uh, almost always the owner is still very significantly involved. Um, they're a key man in a lot of areas. And so that's, that, that's the typical situation. You, you, you just and, and that presumably yeah. leads to burnout. So I think one of the biggest issues running mm-hmm. your own business as a, you know, as a small business owner or as an entrepreneur is losing perspective. In other words, um, figuring out that being busy each day and doing stuff is not necessarily the best use of your time. Um, mm-hmm. And in terms of your success rate, I mean, obviously, you're not going to get every deal you want. 
But f- following on for that, do you do you see yourself growing the business and providing consultancy services effectively where you come across these businesses, you see these issues over and over again? Um, so is that a is that another potential revenue stream for you? Yeah, yeah, and, and that's essentially acquirer's business model uh, in, in a lot of ways. We, we we look for folks that are interested in business buying. It's a long and a complex process. There's a lot of kind of mystery involved, and we we essentially partner with them. Um, they they go through a couple programs first, and we have a lot of training and everything. Uh, but at the end of the day, our our model is to actually invest in the deal alongside them, so that post acquisition we can be that sort of board of directors, mentor, you know, yeah. consultancy, if you will, to help them grow and, and optimize the business. And then the more businesses we work with, the more experience we're getting and the more we're taking that and putting that into, you know, better packaged training and systems to where, you know, somebody buys a business, we can kind of hand over a thumb drive. Here's a bunch of systems and you know, pick and choose. Exactly. I know you mentioned that in, in um, some of the, on, 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 you talk about systemization. And again, this is a common thread really where, companies that grow from a, an idea or grow from a, you know, a, a, a concept. One of the guests that I had on was a specialist in outsourced uh, personnel. But with that, they also brought systems and processes um, so that, you know, those personnel could not just be dropped into like a random environment, you know, that they, they could actually bring structure. So again, is that, tell me more about what you see. I mean, from your helicopter view, dealing with all these businesses, you know, what are the problems that just leap out of the page time and time again? Well, we could talk for quite quite a long time on that. I mean, I can I can speak. It might be best to give some specific examples for the business that I'm I'm directly involved in r- yes. right now that I just added to, to to the portfolio because I would say that this also describes you know ninety percent of other businesses, right? But it's things like severely under-optimized in terms of new technology, right? Yep. Things, many of these businesses, things are still pen and, and paper. Uh, so bringing in software, kind of ERP uh, can yep. help streamline things uh, quite a bit. You know, no no clear roles or you yes. know, organization in the organization whatsoever. People are just sort of doing things in the organization because they want to, or they're good at it, even if they don't want to. Yeah, You have multiple people in one role, right? Which is a big, big no-no. Yeah. A lack of documented systems, right? Which, which is, you know, causes an inability to, to grow or scale fast. You know, you hire one new guy and it, it takes yes. five times as long to train them. I could go on and on. Those are you know, with businesses, to a certain extent, you invest in the people, but you've got to have a real leap of faith to be able to see the opportunity beyond that. Because if you've got a business that's still running analog systems, where you've got, you know, the owner is the you know head chef and chief bottle washer at the same time, yeah. um, isn't that a business that you actually want to run away from very quickly? How do you spot the, you know, the diamonds or the you know in in the rough? Uh. That's not necessarily a business that, that you need to run away from. Um, you just need to you need to understand those those risks and understand how you're going to mitigate against them, right? So the the business owner you described is is uh, in, you know we would call that in our diligence process that's that's a key man risk right there, yes. right? Like I have another deal that I'm post LOI on now. It's a much larger HVAC company and they do a lot of uh, large construction work. The owner is pretty much his main job there. He's the estimator and he holds some very key relationships with large general contractors that provide 50% of the revenue that comes into the company. Yeah. Right. So that's not something that I necessarily, that, that's not a deal killer, but in, in Acquira's book, we would call that a, a yellow flag. You know, we've got, we've got red flags, which are, yes. you know, too, too many red flags. That's a deal killer. We've got black flags. Uh, one of those is, is a deal killer. A black flag, a good example would be a business that has, uh, you know, more than thirty percent of its revenue coming from a single source. Yeah, you've just got you know too too big of a, a potential it's failure crazy. there if yep. that goes away, right? So, you know, this to me is like a more of a yellow flag, right? There's some very yep. there's some very easy ways for those relationships to be passed off to me, and I feel quite confident in my people skills and ability to develop those relationships. And then there's a you know transition period that we have put into the asset purchase agreement, right? That will help mitigate that as well. The the owner will stay fairly involved. So, you know, these are things you just have to think about and there's different ways to, uh, to mitigate them. I, I'd say, you know, something that 
often people overlook because you're talking about people, right? And, and yes. you know, to me, th- at the root of any business, it, business is all about people and relationships at the end of the day. It, re- it really is. And so culture is a very important thing to be doing your diligence on as well. And that's tough because a lot of these sellers, they yeah. don't want you to come in as a new buyer prior to the sale and talk. To, they don't want their team to know they're selling. I just have right? visions of like episode after episode of The Office. You know, we yeah. all, you know. So, from a, an entrepreneur's perspective, you know, the wheels are turning here actually because if you have the beginnings of a business, or let's say as an entrepreneur, one one has a business that one's built, and you still have passion for your business, one of the ways to grow it is through organic growth, but the other way is through acquisition. So, um, yeah. what areas do you specialize in, both in terms of geography and in terms of are there specific business types that uh, you yeah. tend to sort of hone in on? Yeah, growth through acquisition. Again, something not a lot of folks think about, but it's a very good way to grow your existing uh, company or, or startup. In terms of industry location, location, we're pretty much US focused. And a lot of that is because our, one of our primary funding sources for, for getting these deals done are our SBA loans. And so yes. these businesses, you need to be US based, you need to be a US citizen or resident. In terms of industry, Honestly, I mean, we've looked at hundreds and hundreds of deals. We have experience in, in a lot of different industries, yes. but where, and there's businesses in all sorts of industries that I think are, are great. Yes. Uh, where we are particularly focused though, and the industries we like are home services. So yeah. things like plumbing companies, that's what I have here, HVAC, uh, roofing, uh, moving companies, landscaping, pest control. Um, particularly, we really do like HVAC plumbing uh, and and roofing the, these days and yes you know, and what and and uh, it's interesting because again I was t- talking to someone about solar companies because I mean that sort of falls mm. somewhere between the cracks of um, you know service and you know general contracting as it were do you see yourself with the knowledge that you have moving in and being able to actually take over not an industry but just make some significant changes uh, and again if you take solar as an example it's a very you know people talk about uh, you know, solar cowboys, and it's it's not terribly regulated. There's no, you know, right. it's, it's not homogenous, as it were, where you've got different deals in different states. And do you see yourself with your investors moving into a particular area and sort of colonizing that? Yes. And right now it is in some of those you know, specific industries I mentioned, like plumbing, roofing, HVAC. It's funny you mentioned solar too, because I, I recently talked to one of our acquisition entrepreneurs in our program, and he's he owns a solar company and he specifically joined to grow that company through acquisition of roofing companies Yes, and then basically cross sell uh, to, to, to customers. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're, we're certainly seeing, so for instance, HVAC, right? We're not the only ones who are attracted to HVAC that, that private equity discovered that you know, yes. a year, year and a half ago. So we're actually seeing kind of the multiples for those businesses uh, start to expand a bit. You know, they're yep. getting more expensive. But yeah, that industry is certainly changing in terms of it's it's being consolidated. I, like even, even you know, p- people listening at home can probably, if you've had somebody come look at your HVAC system, you'll notice more and more these companies are getting more tech savvy. Techs, you know, the technicians are showing up with iPads. Probably pricing is changing. Probably people moving to flat rate. Pricing's going up because you know yeah. actual business minded people are focusing on these and optimizing pricing. So, yeah, these industries are changing. They're they're being updated really from when they were started. You know, two three decades ago. Yeah. And so you're and you're working typically on a one to one basis. You know, if I were to put it simply, and what I mean by that is you've got an entrepreneur comes to you and says, "I want to buy a business in this space," and then you will find something that suits him in terms of his, uh, you know, potential investment and geographic location and other criteria. Is that is that a fair sort of description of the model at the moment? Uh, somewhat. The, the one correction I would make is we 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 help them do it. We're we're not. We don't like to call ourselves kind of a done for you service. It's a it's a do it yourself service. But what you're entering into with Acquira is. It's an ecosystem where you have the the vendors, the tools. And when I say vendors, I mean for legal diligence. You know, um, you have the the tools, the training, and and our team and a community of other folks on the same journey to kind of draw from uh, to to do it yourself, right? Yeah. We actually had that model where we people paid us uh, a lot more and we did everything for them. And what you quickly discover is you you don't know if you have the right people. You'd mentioned earlier that it must be an interesting task to try to find the right people to partner with, to buy businesses and then find the right business. And it is, it's, it's, uh, 
not everybody's cut out for, for buying a business. And so we kind of switch things around to where, hey, here's a, a, a giant kind of data and resource dump on everything you need. Here's accountability and a structure and our phone number. Yeah. Um, but you have to go out and do the work. And it is a lot of work. But, but at the end of the day, when we're um, reaching the finish line on a deal, and this, this is a multi-month process, that person has shown, that acquisition entrepreneur we've worked with has, has shown a lot of grit, determination, you know, problem solving, critical thinking, conscientiousness. And that's when we know, hey, this person is, is, is uh, you know, we'd like to invest in this person and kind of own the deal together and work to optimize and grow And I think this that's business. the important thing, isn't it? Because you continue on as an equity owner after the yeah. transaction. So you get the benefit of the upside of your ongoing um, support and uh, knowledge. So my next question really is, is there, have you considered with the experience and knowledge that you've gained in these various different sectors, some sort of strategy which goes beyond this sort of one-to-one relationship where you create an entity that is effectively a roll-up of all of these businesses. So Mm -hmm. rather than you finding businesses for someone else, are you looking at saying, let's find something for ourselves, let's collect all of these businesses, put it into an entity, and then get the economies of scale of that? Yeah, that that is a strategy that we're we're, we're currently doing. Um, like as a company, Acquira is uh, specifically in home services. We have our own wholly owned and operated deals that we're rolling up. Um, I'm doing it personally, and, and a lot of our acquisition entrepreneurs are doing that as well. Some people they, they want to do yeah one 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 deal, hold yes. that thing, and grow it over you know twenty years or grow it you know for three four years and then sell it more than they paid for it you know but a lot of folks are going for kind of a roll up and a bit of a consolidation strategy which is smart because you get that sort of multiple arbitrage um, you're buying all these businesses at you know three four times earnings and once you get a certain amount of you know it's several million uh, at least EBITDA under under control now those multiples expand um, the market will pay more like six eight nine ten times those yes. earnings Right, so you're kind of creating that wealth out of out of thin air. So that's a great strategy to go with, and yeah, we have have experience in that. And do you see that the impact of COVID has really shaken out a lot of these businesses? So people have now. It's a two part question. First of all, is there more inventory available because of COVID? And secondly, you mentioned that hedge funds are looking at uh, HVAC companies. Uh, is there a move do you see from uh, investors generally to more traditional sites uh, or types of business? Uh, yes, less inventory. You know, I mean, we're, I, I can't, I can't really speak to that. Certainly when COVID started and, and everybody was really freaking out, um, a lot of sellers pulled the deals off the market and, you know, a lot of numbers tanked, right. We're, we're still not obviously trying to buy any restaurants or like concert venues or, yeah. or, uh, you know, cruise ships, anything, yeah. yeah, cruise ships, anything like that. To be honest, the market came back pretty, pretty quick. Uh, and if anything, it was, it's one of the reasons we're interested in home services, you know, I've looked at dozens and dozens of P&Ls from home services companies, and they're all very strong through COVID. Some have taken a little bit of a dip here and there, but for the most part, compared to many other industries, that they're incredibly strong. And there's, there's you know, Yelp put out a report that that showed data on this. Uh, BizBuySell.com put out a report that showed data on this. BizBuySell is kind of the, the yeah. Zillow for, for businesses for sale out there. Uh, but home services did very strong. And it's because People were at home and, you know, I own a plumbing company. People don't really appreciate the plumbing in their home, but that's probably the utility they use the most. Yes. And if you have a broken toilet or something, like you're going to spend that discretionary income, you're not going to you know, go on vacation. You're going to get that thing fixed. It just, it's an urgent active problem. Yes. And so that's, that's why we like these businesses and they did, they did fairly strongly. And why I think a lot of, you know, large strategic firms are starting to look at these more traditional sort of boring and sexy uh, businesses right and 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 what's how did you get into this i mean I, I mean i don't mean it to be a sort of a trite question but what was the um, pathway that took you to create acquire and you know obviously finding the investment partners that you're working with I'd like to yeah. hear a bit more about the, how how that came about yeah the short story is i've like personally, I've been starting businesses all of my life. I started a painting company, um, started a couple other uh, businesses after I got out of the Navy in, in 2012, you know, eventually sold those. I've been through the startup game mm-hmm. and uh, I eventually got hooked up with the, the founders of Acquira, uh, Hayden and Devin. 
Um, and you can go on choir.com yes. and kind of look at our team and stuff and, and see the bios. Um, but at the time that I, I started talking with them, they were buying online uh, companies. They were buying blogs, um, you know, e-commerce, uh, yeah. SaaS companies, stuff like that. I got hooked up with them, was running one of the companies in their portfolio, and we started talking about it more and realized, hey, this acquisition thing, it's its kind of a good idea. And also, let's look into doing this with, with brick and mortar businesses. And more of those are coming online as people are retiring and stuff. Um, and then we noticed that kind of gap in the in the market yeah. um, where we started talking to people, we, we, we threw out, you know, did the, you know, Jim Collins kind of bullets before cannonball, you know, threw out a couple MVPs and realized, Hey, there's a lot of folks out there that want to buy these businesses, um, but they don't have the, the know-how they want somebody to kind of hold their hand, the yes. capital. Uh, and that's how that's the, the, the way we started Acquira and uh, it's going to be going pretty well. And what's the appetite? Because you mentioned that each deal that you do, or in, in many deals as you do, you come in as a you know, as a partner or co-investor, mm-hmm. um, what's the appetite from investors, and how do you think that that's changed over the last couple of years? The appetite for investors in for co-investing alongside you. So, so oh, are yeah. you looking to build a large portfolio, um, effectively in a fund, I suppose, or some similar type of, of, of minority-held yes. uh, positions and businesses? Yeah, I mean, we are a true minority partner. Um, if we do come in as an equity partner, we're never more than thirty yeah. percent. Um, and in many you know cases, we do just just twenty percent. Yeah. Um, and, and the appetite is fairly strong. You know, it, it's not it, it's it's optional for us to invest in the deal with you, right? You can take our resources and um, you know buy a business and then run with it by yourself. But if you do want that experienced partner, we are open to putting our own capital in the deal, and that aligns incentives. And a lot of people are are very open to that. But it, it ends up being a pretty individualized conversation, right? Every business is different. Every partnership is different. Um, but at the end of the day, we are true minority partners. We serve as more like a board of directors. We're not involved in the operations. Um, we, we give you what you need to, to, to make the thing successful and give you a bit of a roadmap, right? And have you stumbled across, and I probably can guess what your answer is going to be, but have you stumbled across a particular sector or industry where you've gone, hang on, this is massively undervalued? You know, let's fill our boots with this as much as we can. I mean, obviously, why would you want to disclose that? Because if that's your sort of, but you know what I mean? Is there, have you come across these sort of surprises, pleasant surprises? Yeah, like the most recent was, well, first it was HVAC, you know, to be quite honest. And that was back in 2019. Um, but now every other private equity firm is sort of pursuing that. So th- then it was, then it was plumbing. Um, and I'd say there's still, plumbing is still, you know, largely undiscovered, but that's, that's, becoming more discovered um and actually roofing is something that we're we're really into right now and then you know i was on a a podcast the other day and um that host mentioned um some friends he has that have done really well acquiring um home foundation uh remediation specialists or or um uh, restoration you know specialists which i think is is brilliant again it's it's one of those sort of that, that's a high ticket business. It's something that you know, people can't do themselves. It's yep. an urgent active problem. You're buying a house, you get an inspection, there's a giant crack in your foundation, you got to get it fixed um, or it won't get, you know, the bank won't fund it. So that that's something that I'm, I'm going to dig into uh, a little bit more as well. I'm finding of those secrets out, man, because I, I can tell you where there's opportunity, but it's a whole other thing to actually pursue it and close yeah, the deal. Exactly. And, like, it's like know. everyone has ideas, but you know, the the, the trick is the execution. If you were to fast forward, um, let's say three years from today, I mean, where do you see acquirers being the, the, the main vehicle? In other words, is will acquirer itself become an operating company, do you think? We, we already are in some respects, at least, you know, uh, subsidiaries and parent companies of, uh, of us are because we have our own wholly owned yes. operated portfolio. But in general, uh, you know, strictly speaking about Acquira, and I, I'm speaking more to our team, like our team yes. has a lot of operations experience. Acquira, we prefer to stay, stick to be, being a training company, really. We're, we're really good at that. Um, we're really good at marketing, so we're good at, at attracting the right audience to us, and then and then training them very well. Yes. And so I and and we're good at investing, right? So that's why you know we it, it, our, our our little kind of slogan is you know we're, we're Acquira and, and we are an investment fund and an accelerator kind of slash you know, training ground for acquisition entrepreneurs. And that's what we we'd kind of prefer to to be as time goes on. And do you see yourself going further upstream, as it were, when you talk about acceleration? 
or, uh, you know, having an accelerator, as it, as it were. Um, do you still see yourself investing more at, in earlier stage businesses, depending on where the entrepreneurs are and who they are and how good you think they are? It's a, it's a great question, man. Um, you know, we've talked about it a lot. Frankly, I I don't see it. You know, why Combinator? And, Have you, you been know, other... vaccinated against you know um, <laughs> yeah. startup businesses? <laughs> Basically, yeah, that's kind of where I'm going with it. Like, I, I I know personally, after you know buying a business, I'll I'll never go back to starting a business again. Like when yes. you can just buy it, it's a, it's it's a it's a hack. It almost feels illegal sometimes to just you know cut in line in that entrepreneurial process yeah. to skip the years of blood, sweat, and tears building something from scratch, proving the market. Of course, that's fun. Some people really enjoy it. I I do, but now I'm at a stage in life where I I love I love the business of of business, but I I you know I really like it's a weird thing, man, buying a business and stepping in and, and I don't have to worry about customers. Um, I, I get to go straight into Making you sure just have right different challenges, and, don't you? You have yeah. customer retention issues, and presumably you've got personality yeah. issues. So when you know yep. when the when the when the owner leaves, there's a certain amount of um, something with the company that leaves with him. So there are, I think, there are different challenges as opposed to um, it's, they're not all slam dunks. I don't think there are, like there are, and you know, and that's that's what I mean. But it's a uh, you know, ha- having started a lot of business, it's just it's a different muscle I'm having to flex right off yes. the bat. Right, that's. Uh, that's interesting but i guess you know this this is where scale comes in so for um you you know entrepreneurs or business owners that are looking to grow and buying a business i guess just gives you a different perspective because that business if it's in your own industry has been run by someone else in a very different way so you can learn from that so it it doesn't just bring you extra customers or extra revenues it probably brings you different ideas and a different way of doing things it does. And on, on the flip side too, I, I actually, I felt very advantaged coming into a plumbing company with no experience running, running plumbing companies. And that, you know, they've been doing things the same way for years and I'm able to immediately see things in a completely different light yes. and, and really think outside of the box. And it's really made us you know, successful in, in a lot of areas. And, you know, it's always a challenge to bring something completely new and unheard of to people that have been doing something the same way. And we went through, I mean, we just finished overhauling the entire business, um, yes. uh, all of our systems and implemented a, an end-to-end software. Like the entire business runs on the software now. The main benefit there is it gives me data, it yes. gives me data points to understand how how we're doing we're to diagnose problems and stuff yeah, but there was a week of, you know, this sort of gut feel that the traditional owner so that's again that almost yeah. feels like cheating doesn't it where you can step in and you can see these problems these these owners are having and you know that you can fix those almost overnight um and you know double or quadruple the revenue as a result it yeah but it, it is uh I, yeah i think I, I think people people who are starting to understand this acquisition game they do think they can come in and you know yeah overhaul things overnight and they see all these uh you know areas of the business that are severely under optimized but i can't stress enough especially in kind of home services you know it takes time um yes. you, you move at kind of a snail it's not like the startup where you're just you're pivoting here pivoting there you're everybody's you know technically savvy right it, it is it's taken us a good two months now just to implement this software and there was a a hell week or two in, in that where that, people yeah. were not happy, man. People weren't happy. They were having a tough time with it and things just move a bit, a bit slower. I just, you don't want to just, it's just different yeah. dynamics. I mean, stepping into another company, particularly if there's a large staff, then you've got all of the dynamics around, you know, the new mm-hmm. broom and the politics and the, you know, some guys don't like the fact that there's a new owner. Some guys embrace the new owner. So, you, it's just a different set of, you know, mechanics. Uh-huh. I would imagine, and, and that's why, like, it's good to come into uh, an acquisition with certain hard skills. Like, it's it helps if you've managed people, managed a PNL, um, or kind of business and financially savvy. Yes, there's a lot of soft skills as well. For instance, I mentioned you, you got to be high EQ. That emotional intelligence really has to be kind of through the roof. Because at Can the end of the day, you just shout at people then. No, it's yeah, no, <laughs> no. I mean, you, you just yeah, it's it's all about people, man, and, and relationships. So you can't be an a hole, and you got to come in and um, you know, the, the first 
several weeks in this business, I didn't touch a thing. And I made that very clear to people. All I did was I sat and I watched people work and I asked them yes. questions and I typed on my computer and like, this is how things are being done right now. I wanted to understand the business and its people. And I also had to develop trust, right? Yes. I had to develop trust. I, I got in the vans with the guys. I got in the trenches. I'm re, you know remodeling this house. They see I can work. They see I know the trays. They see I'm not afraid to you know, take out the garbage or like crawl, get into a crawl space with spiders and cobwebs and that yep. respect builds up. And now we're at the stage where they, they, they're they excited for our weekly meetings when I sure. bring up new things we're implementing. Uh, and and, and everything I'm doing. Do you have to reinvent yourself for every new deal? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I was going to say no, but I mean, yeah. Cause every deal is so different. Every culture is different. Every, um, and, and you're having to build relationships with all these different types of people, like, and everybody's different. Everybody has different values. Um, yes. Every company has different values too. I, I'd love to be able to just say, here's a blanket, um, you know, values, mission, vision statement I can put on every company we buy. But no, I like with this company through the process of building the relationships here and observing the company, I've started to identify the values that already existed. But you, you have to be able to step out and the new owner steps in. So, I mean, are you, effectively creating that environment so that the new owner becomes accepted because effectively he's being chaperoned by you you become the trusted entity so therefore your reflected trust um you know shines down on the new the new owner is that the is that what has to happen otherwise you end up with you know failure i might i might just be misunderstanding the I don't blame you. I, I have no idea what I was saying. <laughs> what I was saying is that the, the, the importance that you bring is this, um, your experience that you have dealing with multiple companies effectively yeah. creates a pathway so that the new owner can come in without having to suddenly learn all these skills that mm. you've spent decades polished, finessing. Yes, there, there are. So the, the, the thing I like to say here is throughout this whole process, it's, it's part art, part science, right? The part science to this is there is, there is a, I think a systematic way to come in and successfully integrate into an existing culture and, and create change, right? It's things like, you know, you always have that, that first speech when you buy a business to the team, you know, I'm, you know, I'm the new owner and here's kind of where I want to take things. And honestly, people don't care about a lot of what you probably think they do at the end of the day, they want to know, is my job safe? Yes. Am I going to get paid what I was getting paid? Who's my new boss? It's like, that's, these are the questions that are asked. Um, so the only thing you really need to make clear, and this is the science part of it is like, Hey, everybody here, we're all taking steps forward. Nobody's going to take a step back. Um, you know, I'm not going to completely overhaul certain things. I'm going to look for little incremental changes that just improves people's quality of life. It, many of these companies, people don't have benefits. They don't have retirement savings. They don't have a lot of things that more established companies, larger yes. businesses do. So when you come in and implement that, people people love it. By the, the process is, of you, if you're, you're co-investing, you, yeah. you don't just fit and forget. Um, you know, to use a plumbing term i guess um what you're doing is you're you're there you're overseeing your you've got a vested interest so you're continually calibrating the owners and um helping to leverage your experience in other business to so, so the yeah. chance of success working with you is going to be a lot higher than if i were to go and try and find a business myself oh yeah certainly uh, and it's not just it's not just acquira that people have access to it's all the other deals that we're involved in as well like you know, if you buy a, a an hvac company with us you know we we own several right yes. so you can travel across the us and visit other hvac companies talk to their owners and find out how how they're doing things yes. so you have that sort of support system of of you know relationships and best practices uh, i i have a a network of folks that I found mainly actually through through Twitter and through kind of Acquira who own plumbing companies. Yeah. And so stepping into this acquisition, I mean, my greatest fear is do, is spending time like doing the wrong thing. Yeah. And unfortunately, I haven't done much of that. Right. I mean, we we one of the things I did in this company is we revisited our pricing and we we did the math backwards to find out here's where we want to go. Here's what yeah. that's going to cost. Here's what the overhead looks like. And let's build that into our pricing. That whole system, I didn't really have to figure out. I had other people who'd already been there, done that, who, who gave me the system behind that. So yes. 
it just saves a lot of time and energy and that's what you know that that's why we I think exist. the lesson really is just you know growth comes from working on businesses rather than working in businesses and the fact that yes. you have all this yeah. inventory is because people have got that wrong they've got burnt out they haven't grown um is that is that a is that oh, one man. of the headlines that that you would agree with Oh, dude. Yeah. Cause I, like, again, this is a unique situation I'm in because I still work, you know, day to day with the current owners and they are like, I, we, we try to have a, a weekly meeting all together and it's almost impossible to get them to focus on the business within that meeting with me for 45 minutes. Yes. They're constantly on calls. They're being called here and there. And that's, that's the situation. But talking about <laughs> questions and things, um, I think Kylon, I think it's time for the hooked on startups questionnaire dun, oh dun, dun. sweet i don't know if i got these in advance <laughs> oh i hope you didn't because it's so much more fun. perfect you know people Let's do, do actually you, you'll realize the questions are actually quite simple but um you know the less preparation the better i can assure you perfect oh, all right please. and now let me apply my evil laugh <laughs> <laughs> question one what is your favorite word oh pumpernickel Oh, that's rather awesome. Okay, 10 out of 10 for that. Question two, <laughs> what is your least favorite word? Can't. A common thread. I, you know, much agreement over here. Question three, what are you most excited about right now? Dude, this, this deal, um, I, I'm working on working on another personal acquisition right now. It's 10 times larger uh, than... The, the one I just did and it absolutely scares me to death but uh, <laughs> that's that's gonna be the, <laughs> it's a big hairy audacious goal so I'm I'm simultaneously scared to death and and stoked for it well fabulous and question four then naturally what turns you off right now oh the honestly it's this is getting really granular one of the things with these types of businesses you have a price book that lists all your different uh, services and stuff for customers. Um, it is incredibly handy when you've got that fully built out because you can scale fast. Yes. Your text can be out there, you know, selling, you don't have to, it's decentralized, but man, building that thing out with all the proper costs and, you know, the, there are thousands and thousands of materials in the plumbing world that are used on jobs and no job is the same. So digging into that detail, I'm, I'm, I'm good at it, fortunately, but man, it's like, it's like pulling teeth. Welcome and, uh, to plumbing. I've only told that to you and, and my wife, you know, the, the team never hears about it. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. No one else is listening. So your secret safe. Is <laughs> Perfect. Question number five, what sound or noise do you love? It's going to sound cliche, but my daughter is just starting to find her voice with singing. Uh, and she's starting to, you know, hit different pitches and stuff. You know, she's, she's two. So um, it's just the cutest, most angelic sound. And it's, uh, it is. it's amazing to watch that little personality form. So that's, that's my favorite And, and right now. you know, it, it goes quickly. And then they end up going, they're like fifth grade and they come back in a play and you can't stand the sound of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's, I'm sure that's coming. <laughs> my next question, number six, what sound or noise do you hate? Oh yeah, that's an easy one. Uh, we, we speaking of Coco Melon. It's again my 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 daughter. So one of our family members, as almost a joke, they knew exactly what they were doing. Got her one of these Coco Melon dolls, like babies, and there's a button on there you press, and it's just super loud, and it's the same three things over and over again. And she's even figured out how to open up the Velcro in the back and take that noise box out because she likes to press that button. So it's even louder because it's not, you know, muffled. And, and by this is the sound that has to be there. surgically removed from your brain. Uh, yeah, pretty much. And it went off a couple of times during this interview. And I was like, oh, man, <laughs> that's, right. that's just. Don't worry, no one heard it, but I know what you mean. It's that sort of, you know, it, it causes the hairs on the back of your head to sort of stand up. On the back of your neck, uh, question number seven. What is your favorite curse word? Can I say it? Yes, no one's listening. I told you. <laughs> okay, it's just fuck. I, I, that's, I, I but like that's the, the best fuck. one. I mean, it's 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 just the, it is. It's the simple. It's, it's cliche it's, or whatever. But I, it's I not. It's just, all about ah. the intonation. You've got fuck. You've got fuck. You've got fuckity fuckity fuck. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's it's brilliant. You know, it is. Uh, it's true. It, I've I've heard some people like my wife. Uh, she she doesn't really ever cuss because I just can't take her seriously. With it. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll fuck, yeah, fuck. You know, it's just like, no, you gotta fuck. 
but it, but it, it is. I think it's the prime, you know, fuck is the primordial molecule, I think. You know, which <laughs> yeah, it's great. Uh, I'm talking about that. Question number eight. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Uh, I would have loved, you, you mentioned like in a previous life, you would have loved to be a professional drummer, right? I have often thought if I had to do life, like if I had a, a second life to live, I would love to try to be a professional snowboarder. I love snowboarding, man. Um, and I would just be one of those couch bums, basically the exact opposite of what I'm doing here. I have no goals or ambitions except to just be on the slopes every day and sleep on somebody's couch at night. Like that's what I do or a professional musician. But I, you know, I'm, I've, I've definitely tried that, still trying that, still in that world a bit, but uh, yeah, I would have been a snowboarder. I, I suppose it's the equivalent of surfing, isn't it? Where you just, you know, you, yeah. I know people that just in California, you just, all you want to do, because every day is different. Every day has its own set of challenges. They're, they're never the same. Yeah. So I, I can, I can certainly understand that. So, and the follow on question, what profession would you not like to attempt? Oh, I don't know if I could ever be an accountant, man. You know, I have, I, I'm decent with numbers. You have to be that, you know, in these businesses, but an accountant or CPA or somebody that you know just has to do that all day. God bless him. I just, you know, I'm, I think if I, my next guess is going to be a CPA, it has to be. And I'm sure that his answer is what profession would you hate? I would hate to be a snowboarder. It's going to be something like that, isn't it? It's going <laughs> or to be like a, a public speaker or something. I yeah. Don't know. <laughs> And my final question then, Kylon, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? People are still talking about you, man. <laughs> Get back down there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'd love to see that, you know, and I, I'd love in, you know, 10, 10 years after I've walked through those gates to hear, hear the same thing. You know, my, when it really comes down to it, I just, I really want to leave some great things and great people behind that remember what, what I did, right? And oh, I think well. that's I think that's the same for, for a lot of folks. So. I think it is the, the legacy, exactly. Well, Connie, it's been such a pleasure speaking to you. How do people get in touch with you? How do they find out you know, more about you and what you're doing with Acquire? Yeah, things? no, please do get in touch. Um, you can always go to acquire.com. That's A-C-Q-U-I-R-A.com. Um, or reach out to me personally um, at kylanginger at gmail.com. That's K-Y-L-O-N-G-I-E. N G E R, or I have a personal website at kylanginger.com that you can go to and find my LinkedIn, um, f- find your way to Acquira. And we have some awesome, awesome people at Acquira. They'd love to talk to you as soon as tomorrow. Just get on a call. We can share more of what, what we do and see if we're the, the right fit. And there is also a link to a very good YouTube video with you in a band playing the drums. That's right. If you go to kylanginger.com, you can uh, hear the band a bit. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you once again. Look forward to staying in touch, following your progress. Uh, Carlo, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Appreciate it, man. You are listening to Hooked on Startups, where every week you'll hear from some of the most talented, inspiring, and successful entrepreneurs who share their real life stories, how they overcame challenges and failures, and how they mastered success. Get ready for some of the best business tips, tricks and tactics, and some frank, unscripted discussions. Here's your host, Matthew Sullivan.